Hello and welcome to this virtual concert. I thought I would say a few words about the program I'll be performing, which is a celebration of Beethoven's 250th anniversary, as well as an exploration of his influence on how we communicate through music today. To do this, I created a project called 32 Bright Clouds, Beethoven Conversations Around the World. I go around the world and commission 32 new piano works by composers in countries of conflict and unrest, and also places that have unique cultural identities. Each one of the new works carries with it a message of peace. This is achieved by using a single group of notes, a peace motif that every composer in each country includes or responds to in their new composition. This piece motif is taken from Beethoven's masterpiece, the Missa Solemnis. Specifically, this is from the Dona Nobis Pacem section. I chose these notes because Beethoven wrote in the score above them a kind of private message for the performer. He wrote, a call for inward and outward peace. And that is the message of the entire 32 Bright Clouds project. In addition, each one of the new works is connected in some way to one of Beethoven's 32 piano sonatas. When I think of Beethoven, I think not only of his music, but the fact that he was the first composer to claim independence as an artist and to speak about equality and freedom of expression, all subjects that are being explored in the new works through specific dedications. Music is a wonderful language for bringing people together. And the 32 Bright Clouds project aims to use the power of music to express our unity, interconnectivity, and the global aspiration for peace. This concert is presented by the Freer and Sackler Galleries, which together form the National Museum of Asian Art at the Smithsonian. Therefore, I chose a program that highlights some of the works from Asia written for this commissioning project. But first, Beethoven's Piano Sonata Number no. 27 in E minor.
The next work on the program is related to the Beethoven sonata I just played. It's the new work from Jordan, written for the 32 Bright Clouds project by the Jordanian composer Said Haddad. This new work, Funereal Clouds, is a true miniature, a color piece. The colors here are extremely dark. It is perhaps the darkest work that has been written for the project. Said takes the peace motif from Beethoven's Misa Solemnis, especially the last three notes of it, which are where Beethoven uses the words pacem, pacem, or peace, peace, and he avoids the middle note. This is his way of expressing his feeling that current peace agreements are empty. And so to musically express that emptiness, he took out that one particular note. However, it's not all completely dark. The very last chord of the piece is in major and is marked with the word luminous. So luminous may be similar to bright and bright clouds is my project. And there is this ray of hope for peace. The work is connected with Beethoven's Opus 90 Sonata in E minor, using that principal note E as the center of the new composition. Funereal Clouds by Said Haddad from Jordan. Sydney, thank you so much for being here today. You know, your piece, Unheard Voices, was one of the first compositions that was written for my project, 32 Bright Clouds. And it truly inspired me to continue working on the project because I love the piece so much. 
So thank you for this wonderful contribution. Thank you so much, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And of course, the work is dedicated to the victims of extrajudicial killings in the Philippines, which is where you're from. And as you say, their voices have been unheard. Of course, there are multiple meanings of unheard in this piece. And I'll just mention one, which is, of course, the most fascinating compositionally. And I've never seen anything like this and never played anything like that before. What happens is that while I'm performing your new composition, I am actually listening with headphones to the Bedouin movement that inspired the work. So the connection between your new piece, Here and Now, and the Bedouin work that was written more than 200 years ago is incredibly intimate. It's happening at the same time. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this process. Sure. Um, I should say that I borrowed this compositional technique from uh, a New Zealander uh, creative artist, I should say, uh, Celeste Oram. I heard a piece of hers uh, performed by a pianist, actually, and, and she was listening to a Bach piece on earphones uh, while the pianist performed an original piece. And so I thought I was really intrigued by this. And then when you commissioned me for this piece, um, and I thought about the, the concept and the inspiration and the dedication, uh, for the piece, um, I thought that this would be a most appropriate technique. So the Beethoven piece is the second movement of Opus 10, number three. And so while you're listening to the Beethoven movement, you're playing my original piece. And so Beethoven, in this sense, is unheard by the audience. Clearly, you can hear uh, the Beethoven piece, but no one else can in performance. Um, and I think that is a very powerful metaphor in terms of being truly unheard, a single voice unheard, um, but still meaningful. Right, and, and the experience of unheard is true not just for the audience, who, who is not hearing the same thing that I'm hearing, but also for me, because the Beethoven in my ears in some ways covers some of the notes that I'm actually playing on the piano. So there are moments where I feel as if I'm walking in the dark a little bit. And also, I don't have, as a performer, it's so important to be listening to the space where you're performing. But that is a luxury that I don't have when I'm performing new piece, because again, I'm listening to the Beethoven movement. Another example is towards the end of your work, when in my left hand, I'm playing at the very bottom of the keyboard clusters which you said really are like gunshots and relate to your dedication of the work. This comes at the moment where the Beethoven is actually quite delicate. So I'm performing something that is truly explosive and deeply tragic, and I'm unable to actually hear that resigned ending of the movement while I'm still playing it which is a, something that I've never really experienced before as a performer. And also, of course, the movement that you chose, which is in D minor, is one of the most tragic early movements by Beethoven, and written at a time when we know he discovered that he was beginning to lose his hearing. So that is yet another element of unheard. Yes, and I think in rehearsal, that's when you pointed out, I can't actually get the <laughs> feedback from the room, from the space that I'm used right. to. And, and that was something that I hadn't actually considered consciously. Uh, and then we realized that's another level of, of, of the metaphor working in terms of being unheard. And I can share a little secret with the audience, if you don't mind. Of course. Which is the first version of the piece that you gave me at the very end the, there are notes that I'm pressing down on the keyboard that are unheard, that I'm not actually playing, but just pressing down. And yet, once we experimented with this, you rewrote them so that I'm actually am playing them and they are actually heard. So there was a bit of a transition there from something that was completely unheard in your piece to something that is heard. 
I, I like that about working with an artist, about, about commissions, uh, to be able to collaborate with the artist and to receive feedback from them and to um, improve the work based on what, what uh, we're discussing. And I think in that sense, there's yet another sense of hope because what was before hidden is now revealed um, after we work through it. Yes. <laughs> there's a metaphor there, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Well, thank you so much, Sydney. And uh, right now, I'm going to perform your piece, Unheard Voices.
Mila, it's so wonderful to have you here with us today. I can't tell you how excited I am to perform the world premiere of your piece, Willow. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. When I commissioned the work from you, I didn't realize that I wasn't only receiving a new wonderful piece of music, but a painting as well, and also a wonderful poem. I thought maybe you can tell us a little bit about that process that you have of composing art, words, all together as one creation. Actually, I started uh, with calligraphy when I was a kid, and then I've learned painting, and then later on in my life, I've learned music because music was banned at that time in my country. So I still, when I create a piece of art or music, I start from a poetry and painting and, and music afterwards because I have a synesthesia and it helps me with sketching a piece and as well as I relate music to particular painting or a poetry because I believe all those phenomena works together in the history, throughout the history. So it's, it's a process as a composer, whenever I have a commission, I start from a poetry painting and piece of music later on. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the painting? I, I think it's absolutely beautiful. We have an Afghan landscape and calligraphy. 
Yeah, for sure. The watercolor painting is uh, a place where I grew up in Afghanistan, where we used to go to for a picnic with my family as when I was a child. I, I just did it out of my memory because I still have that uh, picture in my mind engraved immortally. And uh, afterwards, I added calligraphy, which is a Persian calligraphy, which shows my heritage with Arabic verses from Quran, which shows my religion. And this willow tree in the background was uh, also attached to my piece of music, which is willow. Which the willow itself is attached to Beethoven's character as a composer, which he was a very deep, very beautiful. And uh, also, a willow tree is a very a wonderful or very mysterious tree, because you can see a, a thick, uh, fluffy tree, which you can't see what is inside. But so that's why whenever I think of Beethoven, it, it makes me think of that tree. He looked very uh, eccentric, I believe, in the sense that everyone was kind of scared of him. I mean, if we see his pictures or his portrait, that he looks very serious composer, yeah. like rough exterior. Rough, yeah. Exactly. But on the contrary, inside he was really kind and really soft person with a great sense of humor. When we hear his music, his beautiful, exquisite sonatas, and because we believe music comes from inside, we realize that he was a totally different person. I, it makes me think that Beethoven would have been so pleased to have that connection because he himself was inspired so deeply by nature. And we know that he composed a lot of his pieces first by taking walks in the forest. Uh, so there's this very powerful connection with the natural world, and you express it through your painting as well as, of course, the music. Yeah, I'm glad. I wish he was alive. He would have been happy to see us <laughs> together. Um, I'm wondering if you can maybe recite the poem for us, the poem that you wrote in connection with this new composition. Sure, so the poem that I wrote is for my homeland and my mom, which uh, I've been missing since nearly six years when I came here. As like other refugees, they're all in one way or another, they are homesick and they are longing for their homeland and, and country. It, it triggers a lot of memories from when I recite this poem to myself sometimes, it takes me back to the city that I grew up, to my homeland, to the village, and to my mom. To my mother, oh westerly winds, I beg you do me a favor. Go to my village, pass my greetings to the graves of my beloved ones. A little further is an old house, my love, my heart, my mother lives there. I beg you to touch her feet, tell her I will come home one day, I will come home one day. Oh westerly winds, I beg you do me a favor. Go to my village, pass my greetings to the graves of my beloved ones. My heart is burning like a flame and broken into pieces, far from my home. I will go home where my beloved cared for me. I will go home one day. I will go home. Thank you so much. This is very moving. I am so happy that you are able to represent Afghanistan in the 32 Bright Clouds project. And uh, now I will be performing the new piece, in fact, the world premiere of Milad's Willow.
We now move to Syria and the new work by the composer Malek Jandali. I grew up in Israel around the same time and only a few miles away from where Malek grew up in Syria. But our lives have been so different. And yet, here we are, joined together through this wonderful music. The work is called The Hunt for Peace and is inspired by Beethoven's Sonata No. 18, which is also nicknamed The Hunt. It is particularly dedicated to the Syrian children and their own search or hunt for lasting peace. This composition is written in an Arabic mode with the principal melodic material stylistically drawn from traditional Syrian folk songs. The overall structure mirrors that of the classical sonata form with the peace motif from Beethoven's Missa Solemnis appearing as a dreamlike prayer expressing the wish for peace. Let's hear a few words from Malik himself, where he speaks about Beethoven, the 32 Bright Clouds project, and his mission as a Syrian composer. I'll then perform the Hunt for Peace, followed immediately by Beethoven's final piano sonata, Opus 111, to close the program this evening. You know, music unites people. Art is about searching for truth and beauty. To me, you know, utilizing all Beethoven's 32 sonatas in such a wonderful project that unites musicians, uh, composers, uh, and a wonderful pianist to feature uh, humanity and to unite us in a, literally a symphony for peace. Because, you know, symphony means to sing together, symphonia. And we are literally singing together through these commissions, through this project. Uh, to remind ourselves and the public and the audience about our shared common humanity. But, you know, I mean, you know, Beethoven was a humanist. You know, he was a, uh, you know, his ninth symphony, he called humanity and mankind to unite in his symphony for peace. Um, you know, of course, you know, um, I grew up listening to Beethoven's sonatas and orchestras. My father, when he was a medical student, I mentioned, uh, he used to attend Karajan's uh, dress rehearsals in Vienna. You know, what we are witnessing today is uh, literally the, today's holocaust on the Syrian people. We have children being gassed to death as we speak. And the world tour of my uh, current tour is called The Voice of the Free Syrian Children, a Syrian symphony for peace. I just came from Australia where we presented that. And I always combine it with workshops and master classes and little speeches at universities and colleges so we can engage students and ask them where is the research paper on the poor children, where is the voice of the children. Um, so uh, as a musician, I consider myself a musician on a mission to preserve the beauty of my culture, which is by nature a diverse culture, a universal culture, similar to music. We had the oldest synagogues in Syria and Aleppo. We had, uh, a village where uh, the language of Jesus Christ is still being spoken, which is the Aramaic language. We have all religions, uh, you know, the Silk Road came with all the uh, uh, music modes and designs and the carpets and the spices and the colors from India, Asia. It was the internet of the era, but it wasn't one way. It was interactive, it was both ways, going through Palmyra, Aleppo, uh, all the way connecting. I don't have East and West in my music. It is all music. I mean, how far East do you need to go to call the other side West? <laughs> am I in the West or am I in the East? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm here. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the Syrian catastrophe uh, is, is current, is timely. It's my duty as a musician to uh, give the voiceless a voice through my music and remind myself and people about our common shared humanity through music. And that's what I'm trying to do.